I like to record these so that people can review them later in the day. Uh, I think that can be valuable. So split screen somewhere here. Perfect. All right. Has anybody thought of doing that? Has anyone uh, reviewed any videos that existed from previous cohorts? Yeah, cool. Great work. Uh, that, to me, is a great strategy for after you've gone through and done some of the stuff and started to struggle a little bit, go back. Things make way more sense than they did the first time. Uh, and if they don't, that's a good indication that maybe we need to dive a little deeper and ask for some help on that. Okay. All right, so today we're going to be focusing on test-driven development with Mocha and Chai. I'll introduce myself first, uh, since we haven't really met um, in this context, I guess. Uh, my name's Carl Jensen, so it's Jensen on GitHub, or GitHub and also uh, the Slack channel here. Um, I've been working here for about three years and uh, started lecturing a couple years ago. Um, I really enjoy it. I, I haven't really prepared for this one. I looked a little bit yesterday uh, what's going on, so I think it will be fun to kind of explore together this concept. Um, and what's kind of cool is we're going to write code that you've already written. We're going to take code that you've already written, and we're going to add confidence and, and figure out whether or not it works well or not uh, through testing. That's going to be the, the approach for today. Um, so my, you know, these days I'm working a lot with JavaScript and, and uh, React and SQL database and stuff like that. Um, test driven development is something that I'm very excited about uh, more recently. The tools that exist today um, are much better than they were a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think that's going to lead to a huge surge in, in, in companies maybe embracing um, testing a bit more than I uh, have seen out there. So um, Mocha and Chai are the original kind of, maybe not original. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the exact release dates of these things. But I would say that Mocha and Chai are the most popular uh, JavaScript testing libraries, let's say. So we're going to go through this lecture plan here and make sure I cover uh, sort of all the material that you're going to be needing for today. Um, and so here are the topics overall. I'll zoom in a little bit on that. Right. So we're going to practice some unit testing uh, via test-driven development. I'm not going to assume that you know what test-driven development is, so I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the process. We're going to use Mocha, which is a test framework. It's a, it runs our test for us, and it tells us whether or not things pass or not. And then also we'll report back errors and, and give us, hopefully, good information that helps us um, fix our broken code. Something called the Chai Assertion Library. So we've all written assertions, I think, right? We've all asserted things to be true in our code. So this library is meant to help us with that. Uh, we could get into way more complex testing. Today we're going to try and focus on some very basic unit testing with functions. But in the future, when we start writing web servers, for example, we could use Chai to help us test those web servers. And I think that's where it really shows uh, its power. Whereas today, I think we're going to be mo mostly focusing on uh, Mocha with just a, a touch of Chai. Um, and then the last one here, uh, it says creating and consuming modules using Node's default common JS syntax. So this is a little bit more information on, have we seen these words yet? Yeah? OK. So JavaScript, when it was created, did not have a way for us to import modules, to have different files where we say, this is a dependency of mine, so I want to import this and use it here. Instead, what we would do is just load a whole bunch of scripts, and they'd all get loaded into the same context in the browser. That's different. Node doesn't want that to happen. So uh, has to, we, some JavaScript has been written. It's a library called CommonJS. And it, it uses uh, features of JavaScript to mimic this type of behavior. And what's kind of interesting is that due to the popularity of this type of a, of, of a pattern for managing file dependencies, the official language starting in 2015 now has support for this. So it's called ES6 imports instead. So through this whole boot camp, you're going to actually have two different ways to load modules in JavaScript. We're going to start with this. Module.exports require CommonJS node style, because that's where we're starting our, our programming, is in Node. But eventually, uh, in week seven, when you're working in React, we will be using a different syntax to do the same thing. Okay? And that kind of happens with, with, uh, with JavaScript, is that uh, 
people write JavaScript to try and mimic a feature to show that it's something we want, and then the language adopts it over time if it's popular. That's kind of cool. Okay. All right. So not every, de uh, every developer or development team practices or believes in TDD. So test-driven development is this process where we write our, our tests before we write any code. It's actually a rule of test-driven development if we're following it strictly. No code gets written until a test fails first. So what we would do is we'd write a test that we know should test that the feature works. We run that test and it fails. Now we can write code to make that test pass. This is test-driven development. When we make that test pass, our, we, our, our test output goes green. When it fails, it's red. So we actually call it something, it's called the red-green refactor stage. What we do is we make a red test, we make it pass, and then we refactor the code, continuing to check to see if the test til, still passes. And this makes our code better. If we just get it working the first time, it might not be exactly what we wanted to write, but we've investigated and we figured out more about the problem. It's a great opportunity now that's fresh in our minds to, act, to, to fix what we didn't, don't like about the code we wrote and to have a test that confirms that the, the code still works with that, those changes. I know it's a little bit uh, scary to change working code. I know that. It's early, but we're going to have to get used to that. Okay, so we want to know what some of the benefits are. I think confidence that our code works is a great benefit of test-driven development. And so here, uh, I have a little bit of information here for, uh, as teacher notes, and this kind of goes through, talks a little bit about what you've learned so far so that I can have that context. That's kind of nice. Uh, you've started writing assertions already, so that's how I knew that, right? Okay, uh, let's keep going down here. So pair programming, bring that up quickly. Uh, it says two days you're going to be pair programming. It used to be that we'd do it all of last week. Everyone every day would get a new partner, and then you'd work together uh, on the problems. You'd you know submit together and, and help each other. Um, this is a great technique for uh, just when you're unsure of where to start, two minds are going to be better than one. You can bounce ideas off of each other, and if you're not confident about something, maybe that person can help you build the confidence to try something that you might not try on your own. So uh, what, we're gonna, what we'll do is uh, people will pair up uh, working together, and it, that's really all it is, is two people on the same computer. So one person should be maybe, oh, actually, there are lots of ways to approach this. So I don't want to say you should do it in one particular way. But if you're unsure of how to do it, then it's, it, it could be that one person is only going to be typing, but the, and the other person is going to be sort of describing what, what they should be doing. Uh, where, whereas sometimes you can have this thing where you both talk about what it is you want to do. One person still has to type it. Figure out how that, how that works with your partner. Talk about it a little bit first, how you want to approach pair programming and come up with an agreement. Because everyone could do it a little bit different. That's OK. Uh, it really comes down to the two people that are working together to make that decision. I think that's all I kind of have in terms of, yeah. Experience. I, I would do a lot of, here it says, my personal anecdotal experience. Uh, when, when I was working, um, sort of not teaching, but more writing code every day, uh, there were times for sure when I would be up against a problem that, wasn't, that was maybe a bit too big for me. Um, and someone on my team would offer to, to help me, and we'd sit together. And it's not just that um, they were necessarily better at programming than me, because there are things that I, I could do better than them, that I could show them that we could pair program on that other side. So it's about taking two people with maybe slightly different strengths, bringing them together, and having that uh, show up in, in the code that we write. So I think um, don't necessarily think that you have to pair program with someone who's better than you at programming uh, to, to gain something out of it. Is that fair to say? I don't know if that was a concern or not, that someone should know what, to, know what they're doing before you pair program. But actually, I think it's better if people are sort of at the same level, so, okay. So the approach, um, we're going to uh, set up a new project. So we'll use uh, NPM init uh, to start up a new project. It's going to have uh, a configuration file in there that lists out all of our dependencies. I'm going to install Mocha and Chai libraries as dependencies. Um, and then it says here that we should implement some function. So something you've done already. Here are some examples, vowels, for example. Let's check that out. Okay. 
It's because I'm so zoomed in, I think. There we go. Ah. Okay. So like a, uh, something like this. What we'll do is we'll first write tests that verify this function works, and then we'll write the function for it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be these, these uh, vowels. It could be any of these sort of katas that we have here. And I'll ask for your help um, to decide what functions we write, function or functions we write. OK? Cool. I think, uh, yeah, so that's, that's where we should be right now. We're just going to start sort of setting this project. Do I have any questions before we get started about the things we've talked about? Really? All right. So I did a little bit of preparation yesterday, so I have a, an idea of what I want to show you. I think the first thing is we should all be able to init, initialize a new project. And why we don't just create a new folder and then start writing code in there is because we want to start using the power of NPM and this package manager to bring other modules, things, that'll help us code we don't have to write. We want to use that. So the way that we manage those dependencies is through uh, a package JSON file at the root of our, our directory. Well, that gets created when we use npm init in the command line. So we should probably do it that way. Uh, I'm going to have to go to my directory here. Uh, we are in week. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just don't have a folder for that yet. So let me. Okay. Oh, day one. That should be day one, but I'll fix that later. All right. Uh, so here is where I want to put my notes. I'm just going to actually make one more here. Let's say Mocha notes. So this is going to be this. This is actually going to be where my Git repo is going is is going to be in this in this folder here. I'm going to say Git in it here, and now I have a Git repo. I'm not going to want to create a Git repo in any of the child folders now. Does that make sense to people? So a good process is this is the root of where my project files are going to be. Maybe I'll have some slides in there later on. Maybe I'll have uh, some notes and all that kind of stuff. So this is where I want that to be. I'll just initialize git there. And if I, I don't want to initialize it any further down uh, in the parent uh, directory tree. So I can also uh, in initialize this as my, the root of my project. I can say npm init. And that's going to start to ask me some questions about what I want to call this package that I'm creating. I'm actually creating a package right now that I could push to NPM that someone else could uh, install as a dependency if they wanted to. We're not going to go that far, but that's kind of cool. So I've got this package name here. I'll call it Mocha Notes because that's what it, that's, it's going to be the notes for this lecture. Uh, version 1.0, that sounds good to me. I probably won't change that for lecture notes, but for a project it would make sense to really manage those version numbers so people know when they should upgrade and maybe not. So version's a very important thing for any package to have. Um, notes for the Mocha or TDD with Mocha and uh, Chai lecture. So that, that'll be something like that. Uh, the entry point. So what this is telling us is, is, or what it's asking for is a location or a file that it's going to use uh, when we type in npm, or when we do like npm start, for example, we want to run uh, the the default. What would be the default file we want to run through Node? Instead of typing node space dice roller dot js, we could make maybe dice roller our entry point, and then it would just run it through there instead because it can infer that right or from this uh, configuration. That's kind of cool. Uh, index is okay. I'll just leave it like that. Uh, I'm not going to change the test command. I don't know yet. I don't know. I could just kind of enter through a lot of this too. It's not serious to add all that. Because I can go back later and change things in here. I can say, oh, I forgot to put the author. Oops, that's uh, Carl Jensen. And uh, MIT license or something like that. And then I save that, and that file now has those changes. It's only the first time that we're really needing to, to enter through that stuff. So here's what my folder looks like right now. I've got a git directory, or git folder. That's my repository locally. I've got package JSON, so this is now an NPM-capable uh, package. Uh, I, I, I do need some 
source code, and I need to do um, some testing. So I would say, if I don't know where to start with this, the idea is that we want to uh, unit, or let's say testing with Mocha and Chai. Uh, you're gonna, we're just going to get a bunch of stuff on here. Right? So I can, I could just kind of follow one of these, right? But the problem is that there's so many. Look how many things there are to follow. And then I think maybe I want to go to Mocha's official site. So let's go there first. OK. Well, so it gives us a list of all the features. Global variable leak detection. Let's not worry about that. What we're going to notice is that this tool is going to give us a lot of capabilities that we don't necessarily need early on. And let's not let the, uh, some of the complexity of this overwhelm us too much. We can skip a lot of this early on and then build up our understanding uh, over the next year, really, right? So what I want to do is know how to install this thing. I know that's, the, that's what I need to do first, because I want to get my hands dirty. For me, it's, I should get Mocha installed, and I should start writing some Mocha tests until I have something that uh, passes my JavaScript parser. And once it passes my JavaScript parser, then I can maybe write some some test code and see if those co those tests fail or not. So let's start with the installation. Okay, it's saying I could install Mocha uh, globally, or as a development dependency for my project. So does anyone know what the difference between these two options are? Because I'd like to if if you're going to run into uh, documentation like this, you're going to need to know what the difference between these things are, because it doesn't matter if it's Mocha or, uh, actually, I probably should do uh, Ava test. I don't know if it's Ava or Ava or what. But here's another test runner. You could use this instead of Mocha. I bet you that they, I bet you, you could install this globally or as a development dependency locally in your project. I bet that's going to ask you. So. It's not only about Mocha and Chai today, right? It's about let's make sure we know how to read some of these instructions and, and ask the questions. When If something like that is not clear to you, please ask, because I want to clarify a lot of this, th these types of things now. This is, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time um, you know, going into detail on, on a lot of this stuff. So uh, let's ask the question. In, in the assignment material, it's going to kind of just get you, give you some commands. NPM install this. OK, well, do I know what I'm doing? It's nice to give you the command. If you run it without knowing that's, that it works, but look at all this. Or if you prefer using yarn, that's something we can use to install this thing over here. I'll tell you, we could also use yarn to install Mocha. So does anyone know what yarn is? No. OK. Well, we know what NPM is, right? OK, good. Because the reason we don't use yarn is because we have NPM. They do the same thing. They install packages for us. So when they say, if you prefer using Yarn, it really is about the preference, because you have to install Yarn onto your machine and start typing Yarn commands to use it. If that's your preference, here's how you would install it. And it would say, you use Yarn add instead of NPM install. right? And here, it's saying, do dash dash dev to make it a development dependency. Whereas here in NPM, we say dash dash save dash dev to make it a development dependency. And then we're thinking, what is a development dependency at all? Does anyone, does anybody know, want to share what they think a development dependency might be? OK, specifically for that project, yes. So that's the dependency. I would say that's more. Uh, if we didn't put the word development here, then in, in both cases, uh, we, are, we are saying this is a dependency of our project. The question is, is it a dependency of our project when we're run, like running the code in production? Or is it only stuff that we use to build and make and test the code, which doesn't actually get used by, our, by the end, end consumer of our product, let's say? So normally what we do is we separate our dependencies into two sections. Uh, standard dependencies and our development dependencies. And the things that go into our development dependencies are things like Mocha and Chai, code that is only used to test our code. Um, so in that case, 
uh, we will opt in to saving this as a development dependency. It is not required. You can just uh, do npm install dash dash save, and it, everything will just get installed as a, a dependency dependency. Um, and then maybe later on, uh, or when you're working at a company, pay more attention to that, because they might actually have uh, rules around which packages go where. That, that could be more strict. Although, um, yeah, it's not something I worry too much about now. You just need to know that there are two different uh, ways to do this. And then the last thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is just sort of this global. So if I want to install a, some software that is distributed through NPM, I will use npm install. If I want to install that as a dependency of my project, I will not put global as, a, as an ar argument, because that means I want to install it into the project that I'm currently in. The folder that I'm in right now, I npm install, it'll, it'll install it for that project. But if I want to install it system-wide, so I could run that program anywhere on my system, then I would use uh, the global flag to tell npm to install it one time for my node installation and use that version uh, whenever I type mocha, for example. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, so the question um, we use the save so that it shows up and adds it to the package JSON. Yes. Um, and I'm going to show that happening. So we'll look at the package JSON, we'll install mocha, we'll look at the package JSON and see exactly what happens when, that, when we do that. Um, let's, see, let's just see if there's any more steps we might need, because what I'm going to do is this right here. I'm going to install it as a development dependency for my project. That's the decision that I'm making for this. And I recommend uh, for the day uh, you, you are doing that as well. Okay. Yes? Right. Um, well, so Mocha, the package specifically, uh, is, or the, or the library specifically, it's meant to be a command line tool. So we're not really using using it, importing it with other from other code. So it should have no effect on the rest of your code. Exactly. Exactly, and so that, that's so that when you type in npm install on another machine, it installs that package there for that. It installs Mocha for that package, and then when you type in npm test, it runs that version of Mocha, and it, and it, and what Mocha will do is then load, look through your project for all of your test files. It'll load all those test files, and if those test files load your code, that's how it works. Instead of your code loading those test files, it's sort of an environment to run your code in more than anything. So yeah, it's no problem if you do it that way. Um, I just think it is, it is a development dependency, so that's why I put it as a development dependency. I would, I would, I would follow the recommendation here. OK. Um, I'm going to start off by looking at package JSON like I promised. We'll notice that there are no dependencies yet, actually. Right? No dev dependencies and no standard or, or production dependencies. So let's add, add a development dependency. Or maybe uh, I could add. No, I'll do it as a development dependency. OK. So the command I'm typing in here is exactly what we saw, right? And so now Node will take, or NPM will take a little time downloading the packages, putting them in the right folders. Two things have happened. What do we think those two things are? We've talked about one of them already. I have not mentioned the second one. OK. In our package JSON, right? OK, so let's look at our package JSON first, because that's the one that I talked about, is that package JSON will be updated. And so now down here, uh, we have a new dependency in this project. It's, and it's a dependency on Mocha, and it's described only as a development dependency. We're only using that to develop, de to develop the code. Make sense? OK. And because I typed in npm install Mocha, it has installed the latest version of Mocha for me. 
I do have the option to specify a version, but we should just install the latest version of Mocha when we're starting a new project. Okay? Um, I said there was something else that happens, right? When we do that install. Yeah, so there's another JSON file. I, maybe I, let's say one thing is that package JSON and package, package lock JSON are updated because those kind of go together. One of them is really, uh, it's totally generated. This is a totally generated file. We never modify this file ourselves. We let the tools do that for us. Um, but what this is doing is actually saying which version of every package was installed. So we can kind of see uh, what the differences are as we upgrade our packages and stuff like that. So we won't change package lock JSON. Um, we can change package JSON, but I recommend for the most part using npm install dash dash dev or, or save dev or dash dash save um, to add packages to this because it's going to figure out the version for you and do it nicely. Uh, it's, we don't have to think as much about it. Um, so that's my recommendation there. The other thing it does, this is what happens when I npm install, is it if there is no mo node modules directory, it creates it. And then in node modules, I have a list of all of the dependencies of this project, right? Is, is Mocha in there? I don't know, right here? Yeah, where did the rest of this come from? All this stuff, I didn't install, I didn't npm install in flight. I didn't npm install growl. Where did they come from? Right, so Mocha has its own dependencies. Mocha has its own package.json file with a list of dependencies and dev dependencies. So these all come from there. These are dependencies that were installed because we installed Mocha. So we get all of the Mocha, we get Mocha and all of its dependencies installed on our machine into the node modules directory uh, for our local package. And do we, do we commit node modules? No, right? Because everyone can just clone a package and npm install, and then we're not uploading hundreds of thousands of files to GitHub for every single project that we create. Those files are already hosted on npm. We should just pull them from there every time we need them, right? Kind of make sense? Cool. Is there an easy way to get add dot? Oh, um, oh yeah, so the question, yeah. Uh, would I use git add dot? Um, so let's go over, now that I have this project ready, I've installed Mocha, maybe it's time to commit, right? Because we want to we want to get good at committing things because that's going to make our workflow nice and fast. Git status, the first thing I'm going to do, it's going to tell me what I've not committed yet. It's going to tell me the status of my working directory. Okay? I've got node modules and some package JSON files. I do not want node modules to be committed. If I type in git add, then it will add all of these files uh, to my um, staging environment, so I can commit them, right? I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create my git ignore right now. I'm going to put ds store because I'm on a Mac. You don't really need to worry about that so much. You're running uh, virtual machines on Ubuntu, so it's okay. But this is there's a file on 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 Mac OS that we don't want committed to uh, to version control. And actually, I think anyone running a Mac still if you are looking at these files there, right, you're still going to be changing information about the directory that you're looking at. That's what's stored in DS store is the current configuration of this, of this folder. If I switch over and, and um, if I switch and I start to, what is it, sort by the date modified, well, I've just, ha I, my operating system has to store that information somewhere. That, so when I open this folder back up, it's still sorting ba based on date modified. It's the DS store file that does that for me. And there's going to be files like this all over our environments that we just don't want to have in there. Um, and we start to get uh, sort of better at knowing about them. But we can also look up uh, git ignore um, templates. And then a collection of useful git ignore templates. If I'm writing, I don't know, uh, is JavaScript here? Nope, Java is though. 
let's just look, let's look what it looks look what it looks like, right? We can just these are this is what Java developers might deal with in terms of temporary files and things they don't want to commit. So we just want to you know build up that git ignore as we go. But the way we confirm uh, that we're not let's say here node modules is another thing I want to put in here. Now, the way I know if I'm going to make a mistake or not is through git status. Git status is telling me everything about what git is going to do. And so now there's no node modules, right? Because I've ignored them. So now if I git add, no more node modules. Is that kind of the answer to the question? OK, cool. So now I'm going to git add, period. And this is only safe if I've done a git status first, or if I'm confirmed I'm in the right directory. So I do that, yes. What's the next command? Sorry? Git commit. Um, I don't know who told you that. Let's get status. Git commit would be the next one if this looks good. So I, I, I know that you know, we want to kind of, I want to teach you best practices. This is what I do, and this is how I make fewer mistakes. Because to, to go to GitHub and to remove all those node modules after is way more work than typing git status twice, I think. So my process is git status, confirm. Nothing in there is going to be added to my staging. Good. Git add dot. OK, I'm being a bit risky because I'm just adding whatever is in my directory and everything down. But that's OK as long as I get status after. Because that's going to confirm before I commit that everything's all good. That's what you should be doing. Git status, git add, git, git status, then git commit. Adding initial uh, packages or something like that, right? OK, so I've committed this now. That's my process uh, for, for, doing, for doing node modules and ignores and all that. Yes? Oh, so git status is just going to give me a, an idea of things that have, have changed in my project. So here, nothing has changed since my last commit, right? So I'm going to now go into my package.json. And I'm going to, oh, maybe I should just change this now so that when I run npm test, it actually runs the Mocha tool. That's kind of what we'd probably want to do, right? Make sense? Does any, anybody unsure of what this scripts test is? OK, let me show you. So there's a section in my package.json called scripts. Um, this script is named test. And the command that will, it will run for me is Mocha. So I could write a bunch of these if I wanted to. I could say, here's another one called. Um, delete, and it would run, like that. I don't know what, highlight, what the highlight is doing for me there. But this one, I could run npm run delete, and it would get rid of my node modules directory for me. It would run that command. That's dangerous. Don't do that. And I think, actually, maybe it was just complaining about the comma or something. Yeah, there it was. So don't do that. But I'm just showing you that I could take any, I could name a script and then put a command down there. Um, I can also have these scripts run my I, is other test. I don't know. It would just run the other script for me. They can kind of do that. So it's, co it's cool. This means that uh, those commands that you have to type that are long all the time, put them in here and then just type short command. It's really fun. OK. Yes? Yes. Um, I, 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 so the question is, um, there's a recommendation to put uh, a folder, I think, yeah. here. And um, I, I think we will get to that. Uh, I, yes, I'm just going to see if the program runs right now and gives me output. And I'm also just kind of showing how these, these uh, scripts work. I think I'm also trying to batch it up with uh, some get status stuff, right? So uh, we'll, yeah, I think we'll get to it. I hope that that's not too much all at one time, yeah. Apologies if it is. But that feedback is very valuable to me if, if, if this is sort of too many things happen. But this is development, right? I can't avoid this process. It's just how we have to work. So um, question, original question. This is, what, this is my challenge. I have to keep, it, keep track of all this, right? So I think the original question is get status here. What is it telling me? Exactly. It tells me which files are now changed, right? And that's kind of cool. But I don't know what's changed here, right? So I have another tool for that. What is it? Add 
Ah, very cool. This is brilliant. Because now, not only can I do a, a status to check to see what's different, if I look at a file, I'm like, oh, wait a second. I don't know what I, I, went, I had lunch, and I came back, and then my package JSON was still changed, and I don't remember what I did to it. Do I commit? Please say no. No, you get diff it. Just look, what's different? Do I want to make that change? I haven't tested it yet. OK, now I know where I am. I'm not going to commit this yet. I haven't tested that. npm test. Oh, OK, so it looks like the script works. No test files found. Test failed. OK, but now I'm, I'm not in a bad spot, right? Like that's, that's, that, that would be my workflow for, um, I'm not ready to commit yet, because I've not done this change. But git status is telling me which files have changed, and git diff is kind of reminding me where I am in my process, right? And I always do a git status and a git diff before I commit, and I go through all my changes. And if I find a console log, for example, I remove it, and then I do another self-code review. Who reviews your code first? It's you, right? And then you tell some, ask someone else to maybe catch some things that you missed. But what you don't do is make your changes, ask someone to come review them, without doing it first. That doesn't make any sense. And using a tool like this to do a code review is pretty great, because we really just focus on the things that are different. Right? OK. I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now with this stuff, but please ask questions about this process. The better we get at understanding this Git workflow process, the, uh, the, the, you know, the better we're going to get, uh, at, uh, faster we'll be at programming. Or at least, hopefully. Okay, where are we at now? 10:40. Let's. Um, should we try and run our first test? Okay. I didn't install Chai, uh, but I don't need it yet. So maybe I'll wait until I need it to install it. Okay. So here it says I can npm install Mocha. This is my getting started section. So I've gone down. I'm in the next section. Look how many sections there are. Wow. npm install Mocha, we've done that, although we did a save dev because we wanted to make sure it was a development dependency. Then it says we could make a directory called test. OK, cool. I like that. So now I have a test directory. And I want to put, um, I don't know, let's see. I want to put my file in there. Well, what am I going to test? We need to now think. What, what function do we want to write? Does anybody have? We've written a lot of functions over the last week, right? Are there, is there anyone who has one in mind that they want to go over now? Because we can start with that. Easy. Otherwise, I will choose. All right. Three. OK, cool. I'll do it. <laughs> um, we're going to call this one the sum test. Some dot, maybe sum.test.js or something. Or add. Yeah, no. Yeah, sum. That's fine. Mm, I don't like that, actually. This is what happens when you don't plan ahead. Uh, right, never created the file because I never saved it. Great. So I can just do it this way. All right. Um, this is going to be a simple function that adds two numbers together. So, well, I'm going to write my test first, right? How do I do that? OK. It says I can require an assert, assert here, this assert library. Um, so we'll start with that. You know what? I'll probably, I'll probably get out of there and just open up the project in my project in my editor instead. That's better. OK. And in here, I'll do my add.test.js. All right, much better. So here they said, we want to import this file, so we're we're in a node environment, so we'll use require for this. That makes sense. 
and uh, it's called assert. And it says it's the assert library like so. Okay. Now, what was our original problem when I ran, ran this tool here, right? So there's no test files found. I wonder if I run now, if it's going to actually find that file. Because that's, I want to change one thing and then test that one small thing. I don't want to do the whole setup and go through every single step and then if I get to this point and I've written this code my test and it doesn't find my file, what's the point? I may as well check to make sure that it actually finds that test file before I move on. Okay. That is different output, right? So at least it's finding that file, although that file is pretty useless because it has no test described. But I did one small thing and I tested it. Get used to that. Make sure, make one small change, test it. One small change, test it. The bigger change we make, more things can go wrong, more debugging we have to do. At least I know that works. The next thing it says here, <coughs> excuse me, is we want to describe our test. Actually, I would say we want to describe a group of tests, uh, tests. So these would be the tests for our sum function would go in here. This, uh, so I'll say at the top here, describe. I'm going to use arrow functions for this. I know they used other function definitions for that regular. Arrow functions should work as well. I'm making that as an assumption, but we'll find out if it doesn't, right? So I've described that. It looks like we can nest describe calls so we can group within a group. That's all describe is there for, is to group tests together. I'm not going to do a second group. I will start writing my tests. And here it says we can declare a test using a, a function called it. And the first parameter of the function called it oops, is a string that describes the test. And the second parameter argument is a function that is, is the test function. It is what code will get run when that test is run. And then at the end of it, we have this verification stage where we assert something to be true and the test will fail if it is not. Whenever we're writing tests, We want to name them well. So how can we test a function that adds two numbers together? It returns 5 when we pass 2 and 3. I don't know. Don't overthink it. Because you can always change these later. You can make them better. You can, I mean, I guess I could say you can make them worse, but usually they get better. All I want to do is get something out there. And I think that this would confirm that it works at least in one case, right? Does that kind of make sense? I'm thinking about how could I, if, if I were going to forget testing, you can do this already, right? You write, you, you've done this all week. You wrote your function, and you console logged the output, and how did you know it was correct or not? Yeah. And, and, and you would equal it to something you knew through your understanding of math to be accurate, right? So I know that two, and 2 plus 3 is going to be 5 all the time. And so if my function always returns 5 when I give it 2 and 3, then it's easy to test it. Cool? Uh, we want to assert, and this is where it gets, okay, equal. Um, and these two numbers, right? So we basically say add 2, 3, and 5, I think, right? We assert that whatever this produces is equal to 5. Anyone confused by that? I can. Add is just a function that we need to initialize. We haven't made it yet. We're doing test driven development. That's why we haven't written the function yet. If we, weren't, if we, wanted, if we had the function already, we could definitely write a test for it. But the focus of this is test-driven development. So we write the function, or we write the test first. It's going to, let's see, npm test. 
Ah, red. Now that I have a failing test, I can write code. That's test-driven development. We can write that pretty quickly, I think, right? So before, before the break, what I'll do is I'll write the function right here. Normally, we'd have it in another file, but we'll, we'll come back after and, and refactor this, pull it out. But just to kind of expedite, you know, make A and B here, return, like that, right? Now I go over here. Now my test passes. This was sort of the minimum amount of code that I needed to write for that. It's a very simple function, so it's going to be very simple. But as long as, I, as, as long as this test passes, then at least I know that it, that it works that way, right? And I, you might have situations before your testing where you do something like this. Right? But we've taught you to assert. And we've taught you to assert because we want to get to the point where we're testing. And we have a system in place where everyone runs the same tests against the same code all the time, right? That these tests and these, this code go together. And this might be temporary, just to make sure you, it works for you. But this, oops, oh, that was a bad, there we go, that's, that's better. But this one can last forever. Because we'll just include in our test folder, we'll commit our tests with the rest of our code. And anyone new to our project can type npm test to make sure it works. And they can read the tests to see what is expected of the code? Obviously, an add function is pretty easy to understand. But imagine a more complicated function with a dozen or so tests around it. You could read those tests and probably learn a lot about that function. So maybe test files can help with documenting things, can help you learn how code works. Yes? For sure, yeah. Um, so here, I'm using this library called assert. Uh, and I need to import it first. I need to require it. Where does that come from? Because we didn't install it, right? I didn't install that. So I can kind of check to see. I can click on this here. Um, hmm. Oh, no, that's getting, comp oh, no. They TypeScript us. They TypeScripted us. Um, try to see. Let's see. Well, we can go look at our node modules and find it here, I think. Now, you know what it is? Uh, this one's a tricky one. I'm pretty sure that when we load up Mocha, Mocha will, over on the side here, say, when you require a cert, you get this. So Mocha's saying, this is the library you get from, from a cert. Whereas I'm, I never installed it, and I, uh, but I can import it. But don't forget, when I run this code here, that is being run through Mocha. Right? So Mocha can do whatever it wants, including creating its own uh, dependencies that don't even really exist in our no I know this is getting kind of complex. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, we can trust a lot of these things with testing. There's a lot of cases where, um, so the test framework that I use called, is called Jest. And there's a whole bunch of different functions that are just put into the global scope when we run through Jest. Same with Mocha. Where does describe come from? Where does it come from? It's the Mocha environment that puts those into the global scope so we can access them without having to import those things. It doesn't make sense. There's no point to do you know, something like this. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Whereas our assertion library, that's something we, really, we, we do want to change, depending on the type of testing we're doing. But when it comes to these types of functions here, they can just give us some globals that we'll just use. right? So. Um, normally, this line means import a node module from your node modules folder. But in this case, it's a special case because we're running through Mocha. That, and Mocha provides this assert uh, library for. Cool? Yeah. Anyone else? OK, let's take um, you know, a five, 10 minute break. And then we'll come back and write some more tests, kind of get more into it.
All right. Okay. So when when we left off, when we left off last, I had run npm test, and uh, our first and only test passed. Um, we did everything inside this one file here. Our code and our tests are both there. Uh, we imported a cert, which is the default assertion library for Mocha. I think what we should do is upgrade our assertion library to use chai instead. And what's kind of cool is chai gives us options. So let's make a decision about which of these approaches we take. So here it says, chai has several interfaces that allow the developer to choose the most comfortable. That sounds awesome, comfortable. The chain cable BDD style provides expressive language. OK, whatever. Uh, you get to choose, do you want to use this style of assertion? This value should be a string, for example. That's kind of cool. This value should equal, hmm, that could work. Or this one. Expect the sum of 2 and 3 to equal 5. Not bad. Assert dot equal. That's really close to what we're doing, right? OK. Do we want to change it? Do we want to try a different one, like expect? Should we? Yeah, I think we should try a different one. I think we should try uh, chai expect and write our tests using this type of a language uh, instead. So here it says visit the guide for this, because they're going to have different guides based on the, the choice that we make. Uh, so I'm going to visit the guide for expect. And here they're telling us the first thing we have to do is require chai. I haven't installed it yet, so, the, so I, 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 that should sort of trigger in my mind, oh, I'm going to try and import or require chai, but I don't, I don't have that installed yet, so I should probably do that first. So does anyone want to guess as to how we would install Chai. NPM, good start. Install, yep. NPM install. Yeah, NPM install. Do we have to do dash dash save dev? Do we have to? No, we don't. We choose to because uh, it allows us to organize our package JSON file. So we'll do that. I think that's a good idea. Uh, I'm not arguing that. And then what was the last piece of information we need to provide to this tool? Yeah. Do that. Right, so here, run this command, and it's going to do a few things for us, right? What's the, what does it do for us? Installs chai dependencies, where? N yeah, modules. node modules, right. So if we were to go and look in our node modules now, we should be able to check to see Where'd it go? That frustrates me. I expect to see chai there. Why not? See, it's small things like this that. Oh, if I list it, it's there. Maybe that's, maybe that's VS Code doing something weird. I'm not sure. There it is. If I, if I list out all of my node modules, one of them is called chai right here. Good. So that should be installed now. The second thing that it does is it also modifies my package.json. Um, right? I just came in here and I looked at this file. How else could I check to see if it changed my package.json file really quickly? Get status. For sure, that's changed, yeah. Get diff. OK. So now I've got a bit of, bit of a problem, because I've got more files changed. And so it's not just like right in my face, here's the difference. So I start to go through, oh, this file is OK. It looks like it added chai to package lock JSON. I don't want to read any of that. Hit space, that's going to jump down more. I kind of get to the end, and I can see those changes there, right? OK. That's not bad. Um, what I might want to do is get diff. Package.json. 
OK. That helps me a lot, right? I can, when I diff, I can, if I get diff, it'll just show me all the differences. But if I get diff and give it the name of the file, then I get something a little bit easier to manage. OK. So we've confirmed. Uh, Chai is now installed. It's, it's the latest version, 4.2.0. Um, and so now we're able to go back here and set up expect. And here's where I'm requiring Chai now. This is a library I actually installed into node modules. I'm requiring that library. And then I have to, what does this tell me? If, I, if I'm seeing code like this, if I see code like this, are we able to describe what's actually, we, we can infer things from this. When I call require with the string chai, what is returned? What, what returns, what does that function return? If I'm using a dot. Object. We can, yeah, like it's not a function, well a function, a function is a type of object, but let's say, in my case, I believe that this is an object, um, and that, and I'm actually able to access the function on it, in this case, by using the dot syntax and grabbing it directly. I could do it like this. I could write code like that instead, right? Oh, make that bigger. Does that make it a bit more clear? I don't know. So yeah, their documentation is saying, just pull that right out of there. That's all we need from it. Because chai is going to have a dot expect, and a dot should. And it calls this one immediately. Let's not even get into that. It's a good thing we skipped this one. I can kind of give you a clue as to why I believe it does this. And it's because it basically needs to wrap up all of these variables in like some special fancy magic that can tell whether or not, like the value bar does not have a, func uh, a, a property should on it unless it gets added by something else. Well, that's what's happening right here. So let's not worry about the details of that. Just notice this difference here, is that we're pulling a different item out of that object if we're using this other syntax instead. And here, we're pulling a cert out of it instead if we want that one. Okay, So chai is always going to return an object. And let's look at that object quickly. Oh, wow, what did I do there? Yeah, I went back too far. Okay. So we're going to replace this. And we're going to say const chai equals require. So that brings in whatever this library exports, which we'll get into. And then I want to console log chai. Um, I'm going to have an error here now because I removed that library. So let me just get rid of that. Oops. And I'll run npm test now. OK, this is what I'm getting back from chai. A lot of stuff here. Look at all this. Assert is an object that has a whole bunch of functions in it. Expect is an object that has a function with an object on it, I think. Hard to say for sure. Should is its own thing here as well. So this object that we're importing, this chai thing, it even if I say chai.version, I can find out what version it is. Because that's on that object that gets exported from this other file. So I installed chai from, node, from npm. It now sits in node modules. It has a whole bunch of code in there. And when I want to gain access to that code, I require that file into this, the file that I want to use it in. And I gain access to whatever it exports. And this exports an object. Is that all right? Okay. So here's chai.expect. And I can start to use that here instead. Expect uh, add two and three. I think two equal five, maybe. Is anyone confident of that? I'm not sure. Ah, looks 
Looks like I could use that. Expect some value to equal some value. So I run that. And it's not very exciting because our tests still just pass. But now we have a different assertion library, one that might be a bit nicer to work with, uh, the language that's used. Maybe also uh, it, it gives us access to do more complex comparisons. Or like I said, when you start writing web servers, I could expect my web server to return a certain bit of content. And Chai would help me with that. It would help me confirm that it gave back the data that I was expecting. So I think using Chai is a good, uh, good, a good upgrade. Um, but it's up to you. If you want to, you use it. If you don't need it, you don't have to bother with it. These are all about developer decisions. And that's why I can't just say, always do this one thing. All right. Well, one thing I do recommend is never to, um, we never put our test code and our tests in the same, our code and our tests in the same file. We separate these things out. Our project is a whole bunch of different source code files. And the test environment is something that can import and use those files. But we want that to be very, very separate. And the way we can manage that is through uh, imports and requires. So this is our test folder. I'm going to go to the root of my project here. And I'm going to create a source folder. That's where my source code is going to go. My tests are going to go in here, and my source code is going to go in here. I'm going to create a new file in here called add.js. All right? This is where my add function is going to go. I'm going to take my add function from here, and I'm going to paste it into here. So now this function is available only inside of this file. But we want to make it so that I can import it into any other file. And the way we do that, is we export it. I've said module.exports equals, and then I assigned a value to it. Any value that I assign to this is going to be exported by that file. When I import add, when I require, sorry, when I require add, what am I getting back? A function, exactly. It gives me a, it's like I assigned it directly. It's like it was in the same file. It doesn't really act different. It just comes from somewhere else, comes from another file. It's loaded from another file. So here we are. I'm exporting a single uh, function called add. And so when I want to use that function in my test now, or any of my other code, I have to require it. Now, it's not a node module. And here it's giving me a list of a whole bunch of different node modules. I actually want to go up a level into my source directory and then find the add function or add file. So this is how we import a file that's in our own project into another file that's in our project. And so now when I run this test, it should still pass. And if I go over to this file here, and I break it, and I run the test, it's definitely running that file in that other function. Or sorry, that, that function in this other file, right? Passes again. So this is how we can set up uh, imports and exports for our files. Yes, lots of questions. Great. Um, let's start. We'll start here and make our way. Uh, over. Yes. Can you just show me where the positions of these two files are? The positions of these two. Yes. So let's make sure we understand. This is what we're doing. We are in the add.js test file, right? And we want to find the add function. So here we are in the test file. And we go up one directory. So we do dot dot to go up one directory, back to the root. And then we start drilling back down into the source directory. So we do source add.js. Uh, you do not have to put .js here. Node will infer that. It, it, it will, it, that that's implied that you're doing JS for that one. If it's another file type, we would have to put that there. But um, that, this works for the JS file. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, hold on. We have, yeah, we have more other questions over here. Uh, and we were working back. Is still questions over there? I want to make sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Can someone try it? I like. I don't know what extensions I have installed. I'm sorry. Um, it's. I could check. I guess. I could look through them. But I'm so zoomed in. Zoomed in. It's so hard. Uh, 
I can go to installed inst extensions here. I can see mm, copy relative. I don't think that's it. Formatting toggle. I don't think that's it. I think, I mean, it's something we can find after, and we can, yeah, let's talk about it after, because um, it, obviously it's it's helpful, but I think it is part of uh, part of VS Code. I don't think I installed a special one for that, um, and it should work for you as well because yeah, you're you're loading these files off your files. Yeah, that should be fine. This should be fine. Awesome, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so that question's answered. Good. Um, you guys have questions too, so okay. Mm -hmm. This is a great question, right? Because imagine if I'm writing, uh, so the question is, if I have two functions that I want to export from a file, how could I do that? Because here I can only assign one thing to module.exports, right? Yeah. So there are, um, let's think about that chai library, right? What is chai return? An object, because an object can hold a lot of functions for us, right? References to a lot of functions. So what I might do in that case is instead I'll assign an object to this and I'll say that the add property of the object uh, has the value of this function here, so something like that. Now when I import this, right, so everyone see what I'm doing, what I've done here? I'm now not exporting a function directly, I'm exporting an object, but it has a key called add on it. So here Now I have to actually pull that out of it, because this returns an object now, and the object has an add key, so I can grab it that way. We can also use destructuring, which is a nice feature of JavaScript, to pull that value out like this. I'll show you in a yeah, I'll show you in a second. So let's say this is not um, add anymore. We'll call it math now, and this is going to be our math file here, and I'm going to rename all this stuff. Why not, right? I, I, maybe it should be called calc calculator or something like that. I don't know. Okay. Rename all this, because it's going to be, this file's getting bigger now. So this returns subtract as well. Actually, I need to write a test first. I'm doing test-driven development, right? So math, well, describe, add. I'm going to break this down into more describe blocks now, because I have more things that this, this file will do. OK, please stop, stop me if you have any questions about what I'm doing, because I am kind of just refactoring this file a bit here. So now I have um, my math file. I start off by describing all of my tests for about math. There are some tests about adding, and there are some tests about subtracting. Cool? So one of the tests I want about subtracting is that it returns, uh, I don't know, 2 when we pass 5 and 3 or something like that. So here, expect, I can just start to write what I expect to happen when I call this function. Add or sub subtract uh, 5, 3. And we expect that to equal 2. And this, is, this was easy to write because I already kind of wrote that in, my, in the description of this test. I kind of wrote that 2 was the value I wanted and that 5 and 3 were the other values. Right? So now is the question is, where do I get this subtract function from? Right, if I run this test, it should, it should fail. Um, and it's, it's going to fail because this function is not defined. So my tests are going to fail for one of two reasons. Either my code breaks, and I get a reference error, or a type error, or some other JavaScript error. Or my assertion is not met, or is not true. Therefore, the test will fail. So those are the two types of red that I look for in my output, what type is this?
Is this failing because my assertion is not met? Or because JavaScript cannot run this code? Exactly. So JavaScript, we can't run this code because when it gets to subtract, it fails. We never get to the chance to do an assertion. But our code breaks, so it should just fail at that point all the time, right? So here we have a reference error. We want to fix that reference error. We'll go to the top. I want to export a function here called subtract. Takes a and b, and it returns a minus b. Make that simple. OK, now I have a function. I'll do the same thing as I did with add, and I'll explain that in a second. And so now subtract is imported, and I shouldn't have that error anymore. Both tests pass. Cool? So I've satisfied that where I export multiple fun functions from the same module. And here I want to import those things. I could do it this way. Still works. OK. But with ES6, it's, a, it's called destructuring, destructuring object, destructuring assignment, destructuring assignment of an object, might be how I call it. What we're doing here is const uh, obj equals I want local variables for A and C. I can pull them out just like that. And now A and C, I get 1 and 3. And I didn't care about B. B was not important to me. I just left it in the object. It actually, it doesn't get pulled out. It just get, you get a reference to it, right? So it's it's a shorthand. This is a shorthand for this type of a thing. Instead of me having to say const a equals obj dot a and const c equals obj dot c, I can use uh, object destructuring assignment to just have shorthand version of that. Yeah. Makes some sense. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like super, super clear at this point, but know that the effect is the same as when I do, when I do this. And we're going to be import, we're going to be requiring objects constantly um, from from modules. It just makes sense to start to use this sort of a, a way to pull out very specific parts into our our pieces into our file, just the stuff we want, right? Okay. Does anybody else have questions about that? I know we're diving into modules and a whole bunch of stuff like that. OK, feel free to ask me if you, if you come up with something. So um, I've got these two tests now. Uh, they're both passing. Um, do we want, are there any other, is there another function we want to try testing? This one's kind of boring, I think. I kind of want to move away from the math stuff right now, because it's boring. Any function, anything that you were worked on last week that you want to write a test for and write an implementation for? Nothing. OK. Well, then I'll make something up. Let's do who likes character counter? OK. You had your chance. So I'm going to write a character counter. And I think the way we did it in the assignment was we didn't use tests or assertions, right? I think it just would count, you'd pass it lighthouse in the house or something like that, and it would give you back a count for each character. Make sense? OK. So um, I'm going to just do a file for that. Now at the top, I need to bring in my assertion library. That's the first thing I want to do is, is import, is require my assertion library. Require, right? And what am I requiring? Chai, thank you. And then what do I need to do at the end? Yeah, and there's a shorthand for this, right? Now that we know about destructuring, we could just do it this way. That's kind of cool. I want to pull just the expect out. And if I want, there's no reason I would want this, but if I wanted to do both, I could pull both of those values out of there. I could do all three as long as I 
I think as long as I call should it afterwards. But so let's leave that. We'll just take expect. Now I want to describe uh, my set of tests. There's that. And um, so, I mean, what should it do? Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. That's pair programming. Right? That's pair programming. Do that. In pair programming, do that. How do we know that this character counter works? What's it supposed to do? Now we have to think about it. We can't write a test without thinking about what that thing is meant to do. Count the number. Great. Count. I'm so sorry. The number. Um, it, the word. Uh, I'll, I'll recognize it, but be very ashamed. I'm sorry. So count the number of characters in a string. I don't want to. I don't need to put more thought into that right now. I think this is okay. If we if we are stuck with thinking about what we should call these things, give it a name, put a test in there, and change it after. Don't let the paralysis of thinking too much about it stop you from putting something in there. Because we know we know a way to test this thing. We might just not know what to call it. And if that's all that's stopping us, uh, I think we can get through that by just writing anything in there at first. This is a good description, though. It tells me exactly what the test is meant to do. So if I, what, what is, I have to think about what is the return value of this function? What's going to go into it? What's going to come out of it? What's going to come out of this function? Number of characters in a string. Yeah, but we have to track, it's, I think, each character with the number for that character, right? So an object, cool, yeah, and that object, maybe I just start to think about what does that object look like. If I give it the string A uh, and AB, then I would expect output like this, right? I don't have to make it lighthouse in the house and have this massive object that I'm going to verify. Uh, I could just really simplify the inputs, and as long as they're representative of how the function should work, then, then that's OK. I don't have to make these massive test cases. So here, I might do this instead, where um, I need to check to see whether or not an object like this is returned by my character counter function. Right? So maybe it's, I expect uh, counter. That, I'll, that, that'll be the function that I import. I'm kind of naming it now, right? This is test-driven development. I'm naming my function now, and I'm not writing my function yet. That's kind of weird to get your head around. What string do we want to put in there? That's an all right one. It's easy to know what the output will be. To equal. What about that? How does that feel? Pretty natural? OK, cool. So now I'm going to run this test. And uh, I get two passing tests. If I want to, I can, I think, uh, I don't know, actually. I, I might have to look this up. How do I tell it that I just want character counter? Yeah. So if I, if I put the name of the file there, then I can limit it just to the character counter test, not the add test. Those are OK right now. They're passing. I'm not going to keep running them just as I'm changing the character counter. I'll just run the test just for that file every time. right? So here we go. And we can see 0 passing, 1 failing. And it's failing because counter is not defined. So we need to go and create that file, import it, and use it. Right? All right. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to, I'm going to go into my source directory. I've, oh, I've got that file. Good. So I need to export oh, module.exports equals just one function, an object. What do we want to do? Let's just do one function for now. There's no point in returning an object unless you really know that you need more than one thing right now. I guess the danger is that uh, if you do need more than one thing later on, then you have to go through and change all the code that imports this stuff. But I wouldn't make it an object just to, to avoid that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Just, I would say make it the value it needs to be now and change it later, because the amount of code we're writing on these things is not going to be enough to, have to do a whole bunch of rework. So we'll just export a function. And it takes in a string here. Um, and it returns. 
know, an object, right? Okay. Oh, counter is still not defined. Oh, yeah, right. So I, I derive my test, and I still understand I have not. I've exported this, but I've not imported it yet. So I need to go in here. That's the name of the function that I'm going to import from there. It's just a function being exported. Require. And where do I go from here? Back to the root. There we are. So now we've imported that counter file from the other location. This, this returns a function or exports a function. So when we call require on it, it, it returns a function. Counter is now a function. And when we run it, ah, here it says it's failing. This is not due to a reference error anymore, right? This failed because my code couldn't be run. This failed because there's an assertion error that the, the expectation that, that what we expect in that, func in that uh, test was not met. So here it's saying expected empty object to equal, well, that makes sense. My function doesn't work yet. It's not actually returning something that counts characters. So uh, yeah, this isn't going to pass yet, but yet. But I'm now pretty confident that it's checking for this output. So as long as I can make that function return that output, all good? Okay. Um, so let's make that function return that output, right? That's not, a, that's not a good implementation, right? Right. But look at this. What's it saying now? Is this... This is kind of weird, isn't it? Because as far as I can tell, these two things, they look equal to me. What's the difference between an object and, an, and a number in terms of when we assign, when we assign it to a variable? We know that when we create objects, they're created in memory, and then we have references to them. And if we create another object, we have another reference to that object. And anything inside of it, if I compare those objects, if I say this object is equal to this object, they're not equal ever, different references. This is what's happening right here. We're trying to compare two values to objects that, have, that are different. Whenever we create a new object, it creates a new object. It's not the same as any other object. Even if the keys and values are the same, that is not the same object. And that's why this is failing right now. We need to use something else to help us compare that the contents of the object are the same or not. So we have to do more of a, a deep equal. Like a, 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 so we have to use a chai, a chai library to go through and verify, check every key against, up, up from each object, um, every key and value from each object. So let's look at Chai's documentation on this and see if there's anything I, I haven't done this yet, so I don't know if it's going to be easy to find or not. Assert is this one. That's expect and should is what we want. Deep. This is the problem we've run into. And this is what's going to help us solve the problem, is we'll use the assertion library to actually do the hard part of comparing every single key value for us of these objects. So here we'd say, expect to deep equal these values instead. So here, we expect to deep equal, and now it passes. This is with objects. I mean, if I try to compare two functions, same deal. It's an object. Compare two arrays, same deal. It's an object. Numbers, strings, no problem. Those just those get moved around as values, right? So it's here that we need to be kind of careful. If we start to put complex data types like objects in here, we need to do a deep equal. We need to verify that everything is, yeah. So it's 
equal is double equal, the answer is mu equal is triple equal? That's not the same thing. But yeah, it's a good, que very good question. So the question is, um, is a deep equal the same as three equal symbols, whereas uh, an equal is like two equal signs? And it's not. They're actually talking about that right here. They're saying um, target object deeply, but not strictly equal. So the strict equal is what you're talking about with triple equals and double equals. So this would do a this would do a double equals comparison when it actually does the comparison on the side. Whereas here we could say, mm, well, none of these say strict. So maybe there's something for for that. I don't know. Yeah, it's not the same thing. It's more like if I go in here. These objects are not the same. They're not, if I say if, or console.log, and I run my test, oops, those are not equal. What the hell? Oh, come on. That's ridiculous. OK, those are not equal here. That returned false. Is that clear to everyone? Right? OK. But if I want to check to see if these things have the same values, then I need to actually go through all of the key value pairs of obj and compare to see if those all exist here as well. This is a, com this is a complex operation. And we've just pushed all that complexity over to Chai. Chai is handling that for us. Um, actually, so, this, so as it goes through, it might do, uh, it says not strict equals. So when it actually compares um, obj a to other a, uh, I think that means it's not using a strict comparison when it's here. But deep and equal are not about e uh, double and triple equal sign. It's more about, does it go and compare every single element in the object? Uh, and a, a way to do that, have we seen JSON stringify or JSON parse at all? No? OK, so it's just kind of too early to explain it that way then, I guess. Um, yeah, the idea is that these create references, and those references will be different. So we have to do a special way to, um, I guess, a very straightforward one would be for So this would kind of go through, and this would check to see whether or not A was equal, equal to A or not. But then you have to also think about what if one has keys that the other one doesn't. So then you have to actually check to see if they have the same number of keys as well. And so there's all this stuff that goes into figuring out if these objects have the same stuff inside them. And we just can't do an equality comparison to find that out. It doesn't work that way. So that's why we have to do a deep equal instead um, so that all this is, is done for us. OK, so we did that. We now are passing our test. Are we done? Are we done? I could commit, but are we done? Because I mean, this is my implementation. And I know, like as a good developer, it might make sense to do another test here. Um, uh, count, count the number of character. Uh, oh. Uh, count unique or count uh, with with unique. Maybe I'll do it should count with unique characters. And then another test is it should count with the same characters. And so in this test, it's slightly different, right? I'm not I'm not doing. Uh, well, I'll still say expect counter. Now I'm saying AA, because that would be my second test. I want to test this thoroughly. And if I get two of the same num characters, I want to count them both. What happens if my function just finds the character once and returns one for it? This, this first test passes, but the second test won't. And so we need to fill in this test suite a little bit to make it really hold us accountable for what this function does. So it should, uh, or e deep equal. A2, right? 
do we think that this test confirms what I've sort of described there, that if I give it two characters, it would give me back this output? Yes? OK. So now I will go back here and I will run my test. And I'll see that that function doesn't work anymore. And why is that? Hmm. Right, there's no logic here. It was the minimum amount of code I needed to make the test pass, but it doesn't mean it works. We have to be careful of that. This is obviously a very exaggerated example of that. Does that make sense? That I've exaggerated this to try and show that it's possible if we don't write tests that kind of come at our code from a couple different angles, that we only think of the good paths, that we might be able just to write code that works in that one case, but not for a whole bunch of other things. So we have to be careful that here, obviously, I have to refactor this to actually have logic in it. Um, and, if I, and if I write good tests, then they will confirm that logic is, is, is there. So now what I need to do is actually count characters. Right? Um, I'm going to, let's, let's, let's implement this together. So what's the logical process for this? I receive a string, and I have to return an object. What happens in between? OK, and what's the purpose of splitting it? OK, get rid of the spaces. OK. So that's a very interesting point. Am I testing that spaces are included or not in my output? I'm not, right? So that, before I even write that code, I've just thought of something. We've just, we've just thought of something new, right? It should not include spaces in the result. Something like that, right? So. Uh, how should we do this? We'll, we'll start off by saying expect uh, counter too deep equal. And what do we want this to look like? What does the output look like? Same as the first one. Makes it easy on us. All right. OK. So that's. This is, I'm getting excited because we just thought of something and we tested it and we're not, we haven't written the function yet, but we're, we know this function is going to be way better tested than it would be uh, if we just had to keep like a list of things in our mind that after we're done writing this, let's go remember to test all these things, right? We put this in our test file and it just sticks around with the code and it's very consistently, this code will be very consistently tested as a result of this. So what should I do? We want to, uh, you said, Split, right? So we'll start with um, no spaces like that. Yeah? Okay. And then, and then what do we want to do? Join them back. Um, okay. I, I could probably just put that here, right? Like that? Is that clear for everyone? Okay. And I mean, while I'm writing tests, there's no reason not to, I mean, just use console logs still, right? Here I can, I'll ignore all that red, I don't care. All I care about is, where's my console log? Okay, well, I put no, sp oh right, of course. No, I should get them for each of these. Oh, there it is, it's these ones. My mistake, I just, um, we're running three tests. Right? And every single time we run a test, it's going to call this function once per test. Therefore, we, every time we run a test, we're going to log out no spaces for that. And so here, that makes sense. There were no spaces, so it should just be AB. There were no spaces, so it should be AA. But this one, that is AB now, no spaces, so I feel like we're on the right track. Okay. Now what do I want to do? OK, so I'm going to loop through my string is what I got out of that, right? I'm going to go through every single character in my string. And when I look at the first character, I'm going to check to see what it is. And uh, I want to add it to my object. And then my second, I'm going to add it to my object. And my third, I'm going to add it to my object, right? OK. 
So if I write the code like that, I want to take string. Um, maybe I want to do, hmm. So string is, it really is a string. And I, if I want to iterate through it, I guess uh, I could do, have we done for of before? We, all, we know for of? I think that's not a bad way to iterate through a string. It's new for ES6, so it might, you might not see it in a lot of older examples. Um, but I, I would prefer it over for var i equals 0, i less than string dot length, i plus plus, and then string i. That's not fun. So instead, uh, we'll do for uh, let. I think I can actually const that and say the uh, character of string. And this is where I just, let me look at these now. First one, second one, first one, second one, first one, what is going on there? Oh, right? I made a mistake. I do that. And by not going too far in writing my code, I was able to come here and figure out, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. We come back, it's pretty immediate. I mean, right? You just saw it right away. And I think that's because we didn't get too far before we made a mistake, or before we checked to make sure we made a mistake. Before we verified we did not make a mistake, we didn't wait too long for that. So now I'm confident I can go back. I can look at this and say, ah, much better. I'm not going to write that whole test or continue writing this function under false assumptions, right, or false understanding. So this can really help us catch those things early if we're doing this sort of really iterative process. All right. Um, so I'm going to go through every character. As I look through this character, uh, I want to I want to add this character, which is uh, char here, or car. What do I want to add it to? Sorry? To an object. Yeah, so let's start up an object here. We'll call this our, our record, maybe? Does that make sense for people? Like, I record all the characters that I find? I don't know. Naming things is hard, right? It's hard. So we'll keep that right now. If you have a better idea, let me know, and we'll name it better, because we're pair programming, right? And if you don't like the name of a variable someone chooses while you're pair programming, talk about it. Make it better, because you both have you're both responsible for that code. Okay, so here's the record. I'm gonna say record. Uh, what does that do? Yep. Yep. Exactly, and in my tests, I'm, I'm still imagining in my mind my tests are going to be, maybe I'm just writing for this one test. So the string that I'm thinking about is AB. And so when I look at this, I'm thinking about this code. It's first A, so record A is equal to 1, and then it's B, so record B is equal to 1. And that's starting to look a lot like my object that I want out of this. So maybe I do something like that, and I return the record. Right? Whoa. We're passing some tests, so obviously we've done something right. Which test are we not passing? That's right. So um, as soon as as soon as we have more than a character counted more than once, it doesn't work anymore, right? Okay. And why is that? Yes. So for everyone else, we need an if statement, a condition that checks to see if we have this character yet or not. And this pattern is going to follow you around forever. If this exists already, well, let's just increase the number. Otherwise, we'll initialize it to 1, right? So that logic could look like this. If record uh, char, oops. And there's lots of ways to do this, so I'll just start with 1, and we'll refactor after we've got one thing working, right? So if the rec, what am I doing here? What does that tell me? OK, it checks if it's in there. And if it is in there, right. So does that work? OK, cool. Yeah. There we go. So if it's in there, I want to take the existing value and add 1 to it. Otherwise, I'm going to initialize it to 1. Make sense? And they're all passing now. Okay, and I could 
Um, well, I'll come back to that in a second. So let's let's keep working on this. Is this is this how we want to leave this code? Or are we happy with this? Any alterations people think they want to make to this? No. Do we, do we feel more confident to make changes because we have tests that confirm things will continue to work? And if it, we fail, we can just kind of revert back. And we use our GitHub history. So now we have something good. This works. Okay. Get status. Lots of stuff is there. Uh, yeah. That yeah, that's fine. So I'm gonna get add. Now one more get status because it's gonna tell me. Are those the files we want to add to our project? Do we feel good about this commit? There's no reason not to commit these. Six files. Okay. How do you remove a file from Git? How do you remove a file from Git? Yeah. Or from, from add it? Wait, you mean you don't want to commit one of these files? No, no, let's say hypothetically speaking. Well, we can make it non hypothetical. I can remove one. Okay, so let's, like, let's say if you want to you wanna, like, refactor like, some of one of the functions and like, put a focus on it. Mm -hmm. And then how do you remove it? Okay, so uh, so the question is, if I want, if let's say I still wanted to make a change to character counter, but I've already staged it like this. So um, my process is just to go change the file, and we'll see what happens when I do that. So let's refactor this a little bit before. I'm going to say um, that I always, let's say, yeah, I'm always going to take record and add one to. It. I'm going to take one, take find this value in that object, and I'm going to add one to it, and that's going to be fine. As long as I say, check to make sure it's undefined first, and if it's undefined, uh, then I set it to zero. So this is going to first check to see if the character is there. If it's not there, it's going to set the value to zero, and then immediately add one to it. If the character was already found, does not meet this condition, stays out of line seven, and only runs this code, so it adds to it, right? So this is a refactor. Maybe we just added, removed an else statement. I'm not saying you have to write it this way, but it's an option, right? So here, ah, we've made this change, right? The character counter. So git diff is showing me these are the only differences between my the stuff I had staged and was ready to commit, but then I made a mistake, so I, I, I changed this other file. Now I look at this and I confirm, is that what I want? Well, I don't know yet, because I need to run that test. OK, now it's passing. I'm pretty confident to commit that. Uh, now I have to add that file. I can just do git add dot to just add everything, but it'll only be that one file because it's the only thing that's really different. Uh, or I could just target it. And when I look at get status now, it's now the latest version is, 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 the sta is a staged version. Now if I commit, it will have that change in it as well. So that pretty much, I think, covers all the things that we wanted to today. I hope that gives you some inspiration, maybe, to think about how you would test your code before you write it. Um, it's changed my approach, for sure. It definitely changed my approach when I started to think this way. Um, and we scale our projects to be so big that you just can't think about it and how to test it yourself anymore, eventually. So we need to learn these things and start to get comfortable with them. and and start to work them into our workflow. Um, if you have questions, please let me know. You can message me as Jen, uh, Jensen on Slack. And again, feedback is very appreciated. Uh, I, will send, I will commit this code. I'm going to push it. May as well do it right now. Uh, GitHub.com, Jensen. Uh, I'll, ooh, sign in, yes, please. And then I'll add a new repository here. We're going to call it Mocha Notes. And create it. So now I want to make this my remote repo. I now have a remote repo, points to my GitHub account. 
So I can get push origin master. And here is all the code, and I will send this out uh, as the notes. All right? Cool. All right, thanks. Yep.